Oh no, that should be great. It's no, it's it's hot now. The mic is hot, and this will be a great chance for us to do our staging. I'll mark it with tape so we are standing in the right spots. So we side by side down the middle. How's that? You and I. Carmen. She's, well, this is better. The key profit. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna have you, Jan. We're gonna, we're gonna need to be a little bit more, like, so archy, yeah, arched for sure. We all just wanna be about an equal distance from it. Mm-hmm. I was gonna say you and might. If, we have to, if you have to stand kind of inside each other's shoulders, that works too. I would say have the altos closer than this high voices, because high Good voices call. are gonna carry a little more than the low voices. Good call. Yeah. I'm literally going to mark it with tape so we stand in the same spots. Seriously. This microphone is very, very touchy. Yeah. Yeah. Heard you, heard we say that. <laughs> yeah, because I pull up the bulletin on here so I have the full readings. Tape official cool.
Just use this for today, but I'll keep that one in mind for the next time. That's awesome. Yeah. I was looking for one just like that. Actually. You got your your lyrics are good because you really do have the right words to say that are appealing to the repetitions. Yes. <coughs> Hi, Trudy. All right, I'll play in two.
Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight as we begin these holy three days. Tonight, of course, is Monday, Thursday. We've got Good Friday tomorrow um, at, oh, now I don't remember the time. I think it's at 7 on Saturday. They're doing a, an Easter vigil at first, and it's Lincoln-wide. All, all the ELCAs are coming together and doing an Easter vigil. So um, I'll send that out to you tonight or tomorrow. So if you want to go to that, you're certainly welcome to. And then um, Easter morning, of course, we'll have our light breakfast in the atrium. Uh, we invite you to bring fruit or rolls or muffins or whatever it is that you like for a light breakfast. Bring some to share. And then we'll have our celebration worship in here at 9. So t tonight, though, uh, Maundy Thursday, Maundy comes from the word, uh, the Latin word mandatum which means commandment. So tonight is the night that we receive the Lord's commandment that we are to love each other. 
And so that's what we're going to focus on a little bit tonight. Um, after the sermon, we will have foot washing. I'll be up there by the altar doing foot washing. And then we have two hand washing stations here. Um, whoever starts, you have to, you'll have to wash each other's hands and then um, wash the person behind you. And then they'll wash the one after them and so on. Okay, so everybody's washed. And then um, at, the, at the end of the service, we will strip the altar. Um, this is a really profoundly important part of Maundy Thursday worship. Um, it represents Jesus being abandoned, um, Jesus himself being stripped, beaten, mocked, all those horrible things that happened to him. Um, and, uh, and it also, rem the barrenness represents the abandonment by his friends. And I know that it's uncomfortable. Grief always is. Um, but I've got the choir members who are going to help me do that. So um, as I know it's, it's difficult to watch. It's difficult to do. Um, but it's important that we just kind of sit in that space and let it happen. Okay? So that's, that is also coming tonight. Um, let us begin our worship. Please stand as you are able. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is a day of remembrance for us. We lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Throughout the generations, we have received and handed on to others what the Lord has given to us. Water for washing, the towel of service, the bread of his body, the cup of the new covenant, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Even among Jesus' closest disciples, not all were clean. On this night of all nights, we confess the ways we disappoint deny, and even betray Jesus, our teacher and our Lord. Our confession of sin is made in the sure knowledge that Jesus is able to wash us in forgiveness and love. Holy God, you have called us to serve others as Christ has served us. We confess that we have not followed Christ's example as fully or as often as we should. We turn away from people in need. True humility eludes us, and we hide our own vulnerability before others. You have commanded us to love one another as you have loved us. We confess that we do not love so generously. Gathered on this holy Thursday, we confess that we are capable of denying and betraying you and one another, no less than the first disciples. Forgive us, merciful God, and cleanse us of all our sin. Then guide our feet to walk with you always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Disciples of Christ, having loved his own who were in the world, Jesus loved them to the end. Jesus knows us fully and offers love and forgiveness unconditionally. In gratitude for the grace given to us and as a witness to our faith in Christ, we will love one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. And, and also, also with, with you. Me.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave us a new commandment to love one another as he loves us. Write this commandment in our hearts and give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please greet one another with the word of God's peace. The reading for this Monday, Thursday evening is from Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall divide it in proportion to the number of people who will eat of it. Your lamb shall, not, shall be without blemish. A year old male, you may take it from the sheet, sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire for its head for with its head, its legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until the, the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, on all the gods of Egypt. Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Word of God, word of life. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Please read responsive with me, Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because Because he he inclined inclined his his ear ear to me, me, Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. 
precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant, I am your servant, the child of your serving maid. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. We are turning, Lord, to hear you. You are merciful and kind, slow to anger, rich in blessing, and with us to us The Holy Gospel is from the 13th chapter of John. Now before the festival, the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you do these things, you are blessed. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, And as I said to the Jews, so I now say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Bless you. If you knew that you were about to die, what would you do or what would you tell the people you love? Would you share with them a final hope or a dream? Would you offer them a final piece of advice? The situation <clears throat> where Jesus, that Jesus finds himself in tonight on this Maundy Thursday night, is the Passover. It is the Passover meal. It is his final meal, period. The clock is ticking fast, and Judas has already made his choice. It is night. He has gotten up and left the table. 
Jesus knows he, he is about to face the greatest challenge any human being will ever have to deal with. And it's not just about him. He's also concerned about his followers because this will be the greatest test for their faith, too. Will they remain faithful? Will they remember everything that Jesus has taught them? Probably not. They are just like the rest of us. That when we are faced with trauma, like the death of someone that we love, all logic and reason go right out the window. And so, for once, and maybe, <clears throat> this may be the only place in all four Gospels, Jesus doesn't waste any time with his final lesson. He is succinct, he is perfectly clear. There are no parables for us to not understand. There are no pithy sayings for us to ponder, no stories to wonder about, no hidden meanings anywhere. Instead, he is direct and he is to the point. There is just one thing that he wants us to do. Love each other. That's it. <clears throat> and lest we ask, well, what does that mean? Jesus jumps ahead of us and he says, just as I have loved you, that's how I want you to love one another. Well, crap. That's pretty clear. There's no room in that for any sort of subject, subjective interpretation. Jesus tells us very clearly we are to love even if we are not entirely sure what that means or even sometimes how to do it. Jesus gives us a great example of what that's supposed to look like, and we're just supposed to do what he did. But notice what he doesn't say. Jesus does not give the 12 a five-minute lecture on sound doctrine or dogma. He doesn't say, well, just believe these things. He does not say, <clears throat> be sure you maintain doctrinal purity. And he doesn't say, worship like this, but don't worship like that. Or, be sure to read your Bible. Or, I expect to see you in prayer every day. And he doesn't even say, wherever you go, I want you to preach the gospel. That's not the final lesson. All he says is that we are to love. This is the last wish of a man who knows he is about to die. Jesus is a dead man walking. And like Rabbi Hillel last week, we talked about him, Rabbi, the great Rabbi Hillel, he could recite the Torah standing on one foot, Jesus sums up his entire message and his ministry in these three words. Love one another. I suppose what is staggering about this simple and yet extremely difficult command is how badly we have managed to mess it up over the last 2,000 years. A famous scholar once said, and I quote, <clears throat> this new command is simple enough for a toddler to memorize and appreciate. But it is profound enough that the most mature believers are repeatedly embarrassed at how, how poorly they comprehend it and put it into practice. Yeah, we really don't get it, do we? We really don't. We throw the word love around so carelessly we say that we love this food or that food or this city or that sports team. We love this movie or that play or that concert. And if I say, I love you, to any of you, that sounds radically different than when I say it to my husband. And it should. That's appropriate. But living this commandment, living love, is not easy. 
And any among us who have parented or spent time with small children, we already know that you cannot command them to love each other. Instead, it is a constant refrain of share your toys or say you're sorry. And we're reminded frequently <laughs> that we are not to hit or punch or kick each other. We hear this from the kids at least once a month. And it's good advice. We should not be doing those things. <clears throat> But that's not what Jesus is talking about either. He doesn't say, well, if you can't do it, well, then just act like you love so-and-so. He doesn't say, fake it till you make it, although that practice can be helpful, can help us get there. Jesus does give his disciples and us a simple way to do these things. Problem is, though, for us anyway, for me, is there's no halfway. As Nike reminds us, we should just do it. We are to love as Jesus loved, period. Which means what he says to us in the next chapter couple chapters when he gives his farewell discourse to the disciples in John 15 13 he says no one has greater love than this than to give their life for their friends the word there is agape it is selfless sacrificial love and so what would happen to us what would happen to the church what would happen to the world if we could actually do this. As people who claim to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, what would it look like if we actually got this one right? What would happen if we lived lives full of love for each other? What would it look like if we could learn to love our enemies? What would it be like if we could love the people we disagree with and not love them just a little bit, but with real, honest-to-goodness, unselfish love? I can't help but be reminded of one of my favorite stories, which is the Velveteen Rabbit. And there's that, that part about, oh, two-thirds through, where the rabbit is having a conversation with the skin horse in the nursery, and he's asking him what it means to be real. And the rabbit says, does it mean that you have things that buzz inside of you and you have a stick-out handle? Well, real isn't how you are made, says the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. <clears throat> when a child loves you, for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really, really loves you, then you become real. Well, does it hurt? He asked. Well, sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful, but when you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Well, does it happen all at once, like being wound up, the rabbit asked, or does it happen kind of bit by bit? Well, it doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. <clears throat> you become. And it takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily or have sharp edges or have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real... You cannot be ugly except to people who do not understand. Love makes us real. Loving one another seems like a very simple command, and it is simple, but it doesn't mean it's easy. Because frankly, if it was easy, we'd already be doing it. It was the dying wish of Jesus to his followers 
that we learn how to love each other. <clears throat> and there is a lot on the line if we don't. But what does it mean if we can't figure out how to do this? Well, in our day and time, we are seeing evidence of this all around us. The consequences of not loving each other are becoming catastrophic. When we fail to love, it means that the world does not know what the world needs to know about God's love. When we fail to love, people will not know how much God loves them. And they will choose to believe other stories instead. Like this whole Jesus thing is just not real. Or that the resurrection never really happened and it doesn't make any difference. Or that God is a mean, angry, vindictive parent who is determined to punish sinners and not just punish them, but actually delight in doing it. Or that it is God's will that bad things happen to them and that the world is a cold, meaningless, and loveless place. When we don't love each other, people look at us and they say that the church is just a bunch of hypocrites who gather together to make themselves feel better because they don't understand that we are the living, breathing body of Christ, empowered to heal and empowered to change the world with love. Our love for each other is how the world will know who we are and whose we are. Our love for each other is how the world will see and taste and touch and hear and find and know Jesus. And it is through our love. And it is how we treat one another. That's how we embody and incarnate Jesus here and now today. This is how we make Jesus relatable and possible and plausible to a world that is desperate to hear this good, good news. <clears throat> this is Christ's command to us. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. And it's a lot to shoulder. But you know, what's at stake or what happens when we decide not to love What's at stake is that we have to decide how we're going to respond to this dying wish of our Savior. And there are some days when loving one another feels like too much. It's too heavy of a burden to carry. And when those days come, there are Good. There is good news because Jesus does not leave us alone to flounder and fumble our way through. He gives us a roadmap, a clear and beautiful way forward. And he says, just do what I did. Love one another as I have loved you. We are to do what he did and we are to love as he, <clears throat> as he loved and we are to live as he lived. Which means that we are to weep with those who weep and we laugh with those who laugh. We are to touch the untouchables and to be a voice for the voiceless. We are to feed the hungry and welcome the children and release the captives. We are to forgive the sinner and confront the oppressor and comfort the oppressed. We are to wash one another's feet. And yes, this command can be overwhelming but it is not meant for us to wear ourselves out by trying to create love from our own spent resources. No, we are invited, Jesus invites us to abide with him. We are invited to abide with the one whose source of love is like a fountain that never runs dry. This love that Jesus commands for us to have one another, for one another, it cannot be found within ourselves but it is found in him. And that's really good news too. Because in Jesus, there is always more than enough. Jesus always has plenty of love to go around. 
And if we feel that we are in short supply this week, or with this person or that situation, all we have to do is ask for help. Because there are no parched places where Jesus cannot and will not enter in and drench with love. So, if you knew you were about to die, what would you tell the people you love? Would you share a final hope or dream with them? Would you offer one last piece of advice? Would you offer them love? I hope so. Our friends need it. Our families need it. The world needs it. May we learn to love. May we learn to live in love with one another and with all people. And may we learn what it means to serve in love. Amen. to participate tonight in the hand washing and foot washing, you are welcome to come forward.
you are able. We are God's people by baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope. Let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us join our hearts and our minds together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day. As we gather together on this holy night, we are painfully aware, Lord, of what is ahead of you as you are as well. Help us to be faithful. Help us to love each other. Help us to listen to your command to us, as hard as it is sometimes. Help us to be kind and loving to one another, to our enemies, to the people who drive us nuts. You've commanded us to love, Lord, and you promise to, to fill our needs and to drench us with your love. And so we ask for that this night. Drench us with your love and your grace and your mercy. Forgive us where we have erred and put us on the right path again. But above all, we ask, Lord, that you help us to love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church throughout the world and we ask a special blessing on every faithful heart who gathers in your name, especially in these three days. Shower us with your love, O God. Help us to work together that we might all be your love and light in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the nations of the world. We pray for those who are suffering, especially those in Ukraine, for those in Russia after that terrible, violent incident that happened earlier this week maybe it was last week, 
We pray for the people of Israel. We pray for the people of Gaza, that they, can, they would be able to live in peace. We pray for the people of um, Hamas and Hezbollah. We pray, Lord, that you would fill their hearts with love. We pray, Lord, for every place around the world that is in desperate need of your love and care and compassion and peace. And we pray that your spirit would go into those places and change people's hearts so that we can all learn to live together in love and peace and harmony. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our own country is in desperate need of your love, O oh God. We pray for the people of, um, was it Rock? Rockland, Rock something, Illinois, uh, where the, the stabbing happened yesterday. Uh, we pray for the people of New York, where a police officer was shot. We pray for all these, all these places, Lord, that are known to you, known to us. I just can't come up with them. There are so many. We pray for every community that has been rocked by violence. We pray that you would be with those people who are grieving be with people who are angry. Be with people who need you. And just shower all of us with your great and unending love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, especially Pat Harris. We pray for the sad. We pray for the lonely. We pray for those who are grieving. And we pray for those who are dying. We pray for those who do not know you that they would come to know of your amazing love that you have for all of us. Hear now the names we lift before you who are in special need of your loving care, whether we speak those names out loud or from within our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank and praise you, O oh God, for the ways that you use us here at St. Andrews. We are not perfect, we squabble and we argue with each other, but underneath all of that, there is deep and abiding love, and we are so grateful for that. Continue to bless us, O oh God. Use our hands and our feet and our hearts to make your name known in all that we say and all that we do, as we are reaching out and sharing grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh God, we command all for whom we pray. Trusting that you hear us and you will answer us, for we lift these prayers to you in the mighty and amazing name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Please stand as you are able. On the night before he died, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to them all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is God's table, and everyone is welcome here. So come, you who have great faith and you who wish you had more. Come, you who've been here often and you who've not been for a long time. Come, you who have tried to follow and you who have fallen short. Come, not because I invite you, but because God desires to meet you here. And for those celebrating at home, please know you are part of this table and part of this meal. This is the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. The congregation may be seated. Oh, 
commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you you also should love one another by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another amen Lord Jesus in a wonderful sacrament you strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering death and resurrection may this sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way we live for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? 
from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me, and they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for whom he, del for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my, brother, at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shard, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, Come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, Praise him, all you offspring of Jacob. Glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generations. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. <laughs> 